said is an orientation and the orientation is designed to give you some background uh, both in terms of what it is authority, what does the code look like, and in addition, I read some policy issues. So just some things that when you think about the code, think about some of the policy issues. Um, by the way, we moved into chapter two. Chapter two talks broadly about this concept of income. We talked about income under code section what? Code section 61. And it's code section 61 says that any accretion to your wealth, no matter what its source, is subject to tax. And um, we looked at all the very, a number of variations. Not, I should use, be careful my use of the word all. We looked at um, your employer paying your taxes. We looked at illegal income, uh, all sorts of things, and future damages, all subject to tax. The only thing that um, wasn't subject to tax, and then I need a reason why, uh, Shervon, do you remember? Well, wasn't subject to tax in Chapter 2, and the, the reason why it wasn't subject to tax? All right, that's okay, Han. Can you say it loudly? Inherited. Inherited? But that's in Chapter 3. So in Chapter 2, Natalie? Imputed income. Imputed income. And what's your authority for imputed income not being taxable? Oh. And what, what's not taxable? <coughs> well, the independent life insurance. Don't say to Helbring because Helbring was the commissioner and his name adorns many, many okay. cases, right? So uh, we learn as early as chapter two that not all accretions to wealth are taxable. Agreed? We moved on to so chapter two. Any questions? How was there? The imputed income, which one? Under section what? There's no code section. It's, our authority is a U.S. Supreme Court case. Elvering versus Independent Life Insurance Company. It's at the very end of, not the very end, towards the end of chapter two. Got it? But it doesn't say anywhere in the code. Right? So this is something you have to pick up. All right, then we moved on. Again, to look at chapter three. And again, the, the authors of our textbook are going to include all solutions, but they give us a taste of chapter three. We looked at quests, right? And we said, yes, if it quests, put section 102A, and it where things are in the code are not arbitrary. Beginning with Code Section 101. Code Section 101 excludes what? Life insurance proceeds. By the way, can I ask, are there a lot of interviews today? Or why, why are... So, okay. Okay, so gifts and bequests. What is a gift? What is a bequest? And Duberstein. Well, Duberstein is actually a combination of two cases, right? Duberstein case and the Stanton case. And... You have to see if a person, for example, receives a Cadillac. What was the motivation in giving the Cadillac, right? And I reminded you the fact that this gift, there may be a limit on what's deductible. The fact that there's a limit on what's deductible doesn't limit necessarily what's includable. So if you recall in Duberstein, the US Supreme Court held that that was not a gift, that was compensatory in nature. In Stanton, the case was remanded to determine whether or not it was truly a gift, and ultimately the lower courts did decide that it was a gift, the gift and what's the quest. So that's found in 102A, and I said 101 deals with life insurance proceeds, 102 deals with gifts and bequests. Code section 103, code section 103 deals with um, interest. A municipal bonds, not subject to tax. 
Code sections 104, 105, 106. Yellow is used pertaining to um, receipt of health care benefits, not subject to tax. 107 deals with ministries and clergy who receive free housing. So these are all, again, where things are in the code, we'll see, plays an important role in determining what are the tax implications. So Code Section 101A says, in general, gifts and bequests are not taxed. You have an exception to 102A. Process, do you know what the exception is? We know it's not, the receipt of gifts is not taxable. I'm not trying to be cryptic, Wendy. What am I referring to? Huh? What was I referring to? Employer gifts, right? Or employee gifts, right? On what's the general rule? 102C say that the receipt of a gift in the employment context, right, by your employer is never a gift. 102A does not apply, right? 102A. So 102C negates 102A, right? Through an exception to the exception. Uh, the holiday gift from the employers can be like, but I don't know about the. the you say holiday gift in what context? The, like a true generosity. That's not what it's referring to. Because your employer can be truly generous. Well, if you have an object of your natural bounty, where is the authority for this, Nelly? Where's the exception to the exception, the authority, guys? Where's the authority? Is it the proposed regulation, 102-1F2? Right? So now, right, now we've got regulatory authority, right? It's not in the code. The regulations spell out that in the context of, say, a family where you have a child who works for you, you can give a gift to him or her, right? And even though they work for you, and normally 102C would negate 102A, the proposed regulation says it constitutes a bona fide gift, right? So it would not be taxed. It's the code, it's the regulation. Regulation. 102-1F2. Proposed regulation. 102-1F1 and 2. And this is on what page? So we're nine, page nine fifty three. You got that? It's going to be up to you to make sure you get these rules down. Then we looked at inheritances. We saw that you receive an inheritance generally tax free, right? And just bear in mind the Internal Revenue Code does have an estate and gift tax. Those taxes, though, are imposed on the person giving the gift or making the bequest, right? They're not imposed on the recipient of the gift or bequest, right? We went through um, the Light v. Hoey case, then we turned our attention to the Waldorf case, uh, and we saw that sometimes people call bequest something, or put a label that's self-serving and it does not control, right? Self-serving label, do not control. And the taxpayer, if you recall, in the water decision, lost, right? So we then turned our attention to Chapter 4. Before I go on, any questions on Chapter 3? We're all good on Chapter 3? Let's talk about Chapter 4 and its structure. Make sure everyone's with me. So... Chapter 4 talks about fringe benefits. Are fringe benefits generally taxable or not, Jack? Um, well, in general, they are, except for the um, exceptions within uh, Section 132. Hey, what's your authority for the proposition that they're generally taxable? Um, it would be uh, Code Section 61. It would be, but is there regulation more on point? You're not wrong. But there is, is there better authority? Better authority for the proposition that fringe benefits are generally taxable, except if they fall within the purview of Section 132. The authors say, 
point out in Regulation 61-21. Regulation 61-21. We have an enumeration of those fringe benefits that are not subject to tax. Okay? Those are enumerated in Code Section 132A. But they're probably they're fairly skeletal, right? 132A. And then where are these enumerated further? 132B, 132C, 132D, 132E, 132. All those are further enumerations, right? Of what constitutes non taxable fringe benefits. So no additional cost services. Recall, um, in this case, and let me just see. Keep, uh, Justin, can you type an answer? Can you hear me, Justin? Want to give us an example of no additional cost service? So, Justin, can you give us an example of no additional cost service? It's not a yes or no question. How can you tell if he's typing it? Hotel room. All right, Justin. <laughs> Thank you. And do you want to add anything, Justin? Can any hotel room qualify for no additional cost service? All hotel rooms, if you work for the hotel. No, okay. Elaborate, please, Justin. All right. You want me to interject, Justin? You're, you're stymied by my question? Or does someone want to raise your hand? Young? Uh, if it doesn't, doesn't incur any more cost. To the and what's an additional cost? For example, if hotel is like an empty room and there's no... Right. Um, if you, if you have to remove a pay, only offer for sale to the customers, no other question business. Justin, what I was referring to is we didn't want to remove a ping, right? We don't want to remove a ping client, right? Because then there is an additional cost, right? And then, um, then let's write it a little bit deeper. Your name. You see it, but I, I only have the little letters there. All right. So um, let's see. By, by the way, guys, help me out here. What, what is short, or how do I pronounce K-E-X-I-A-N-G? Who is that? Well, you can call him last name, Ying. What's your short name? Ying. Ying? Yeah. yeah. This is the last name. Ying, can you hear us? Hopefully you can, and hopefully you're awake. So, uh, yes, uh, yes. <laughs> okay. Good to hear your voice from above. So, Eng, with respect to um, qualified employee discount, and any, is any discount not taxable, Eng, or are there limitations? Uh, 20%. 100%? I'm sorry. What's the limitation? Uh, up to 20%. Up to what percent? 20%. 20% in all instances? Uh... Let me let me check. <laughs> okay. And, and on, let me ask John Ho. Yeah. Any discount permissible? What does that mean to the entire population? I'm the client. What does that mean? Has to be offered to everyone. Can't be discriminatory. Yeah. That's 132J. But Jiang, what were you uh, going to say? For the services, it's limited to 20% for the goods. I think. It cannot exceed the gross profit percentage. Right. For services, right, Ang? It can't exceed 20% for non-services, for products. It can ex it can exceed the gross profit ratio. It can, but if anything that exceeds the gross profit ratio will be taxed under what? 61, right? Yeah. All right, so remember, Internal Revenue Code does not set policy. It just talks about tax issues. It's not going to set a prohibition, right? As pointed out, if these benefits are discriminatory under Code Section 132J, they will be taxable to the highly compensated, right? Did working condition fringe benefits, minimum fringe benefits, most like a free coffee in the morning, not taxable. Anyone who enjoys Fancy Starbucks coffee uh, knows that a good cup of coffee at Starbucks or elsewhere can cost three, four dollars, right? If you get the large, 
And there it is. Your employer is offering you a free cup every day. Do the mathematics. That could add up to over $1,000 worth of free coffee. All by transportation fringes, certain limitations, not taxable. Athletic facilities, not taxable. This benefit. What's the benefit of Code Section 132? Justin, does it only extend to employees? Let me let, let me ask behind you. You said, did I say that right? Got to get I got to get used to saying it right. Eugene, does it only extend to employees? But say yes, right? No, oh no, not G H. 132H. And it's a dependent source. Right. So in certain fringe benefits, it goes beyond, right, Justin? But I just wanted you to be more specific. Um, what 32H says, spouse and dependent children. That brings us up. Anyone have questions? That brings us up to where we are today, right? And research it. We're not going to go into detail uh -oh. about that. Okay? Do a little research on that. You'll find your answer. Any other questions on the material we covered so far? We're going to have Code Section 119 open. Title Meals or Lodging Furnished for the Convenience of the Employer. Code Section 119A. There shall be excluded from gross income of an employee the value of any meals or lodging furnished to him, his spouse, or any of his dependents by or behalf of the, his employer for the convenience of the employer, but only if, in the case of meals, the meals are furnished on the business premises, or in the case of lodging, the employee is required to accept such lodging on the business premises of his employer as a condition of his employment. And Chia, you're going to have to yell because I got a feeling that our WebEx people are not going to be able to hear you. <coughs> okay, so this man lives apartment on the premises of a funeral home that he was president and the general manager, and um, he excludes the value of the apartment from his uh, income, uh, gross income. He excluded, right? Yeah. So we have the president of a funeral home, he's excluding the value of an apartment from gross income, right? Everybody got the visual? Yeah. And the IRS is challenging, right? The IRS is saying it should be taxed. What basis, Shia, does he say it's excluded? What's his authority? Uh, Code section 119, right? And Shia, by contrast, what section is the IRS saying it's taxable? 61, okay. Everyone see the, the fight going on here? Right? Now, Shia, was there any other fact? Un, un, not tax related, not tax related, that stood out to you? That's that because of the job, but my question is not tax related. Is there any fact here that you said, boy, that's an interesting fact? Because when you're reading, right, guys, you want to have a curious mind and you want to think to yourself, boy, there's a. Natalie, what was that interesting fact? My. What was that? My. And what about his wife? He was 43, he was 25. Yeah. Spot on, right? You're like, boy, where did she get this young guy from, right? <laughs> yeah. Right? She's 43, he's 25. It reminds me of which marriage? Demi Moore and Ashton Kutcher, right? How long did that marriage last, guys? Not very long, right? All right? So... Right, she had, you read that fact, and you're like, whoa, what's going on here? All right? So, all right, Natalie picked up on it, though. All right, so the question we have is, is it tax, right? Is it tax? Um, and remember, if you look at page 101, three conditions have to be met under issue four, right? Three conditions. The lodging is on the business premises, the employee is required, and the lodging is furnished for the convenience of the employer. What does the case hold here, Shia? Who wins? The taxpayer wins, right? The taxpayer says that this test was met. Now, admittedly, 
in a context of a closely held business. When you're just, was this a closely held business? Absolutely, right? So remember, when the employer says you must live here to get the job, essentially the guy has to look in the mirror and say, you must live here to get the job, right? Everyone had the visual of that? Because it's not like a big company, like you work for the big four, they may set up certain conditions that you have to adhere to and you know you're not going to get the job unless you adhere to. The close sale context, it's not as self-policing, right? Young? I mean, did the court take consider about um, the nature of the industry? Because I know many funeral homes, you know, must live in the building. I don't know, it's a law or something, but... There's no, there's no law, but it makes sense, right? Because why does it make sense to have people on premises? Yeah, they got to pick up corpses, right? Yeah. And if you want the business, then you make the call and no one's there, they're calling the next funeral home, right? You know, people don't want to sit around and wait until morning, right? Not the most pleasant a job. So, so the authors talk about this and they raise some problems. And let me just raise, raise this issue with you. From an administrative point of view, Congress, why did Congress put for institute or an act, put section 119? Why did Congress, you're not going to find it in your book, I'm asking you to think for yourself. Why did Congress put in code section 119? Do you want to have some thoughts? John? I think it's more like, a, it's, in my opinion, it's like a, for um, social welfare purpose. Social welfare. Because if the employees, are um, able to offer these benefits to employees without being taxed, you know, you'd be glad to do it. I, that's what I'm saying. So. so it's to promote this industry? Yeah, promote like um, benefits promote to, to offer the, the lodging, offer the meals. But they could do the same thing in the accounting industry and have your employer offer you housing. You know, Ernst & Young can have under to promote it, um, have half the building is where the business half is, they could turn a commercial building half commercial, half residential, and have you on the premises. Jack, you were going to comment? Servan? Uh, promote uh, jobs, that's one. Not only you have to live by. They have to live on the premises, so what do you draw away from that? Take away from your family, take away from your So I'm not sure what conclusion you're drawing. You have to give up a lot. Right? What do you have to give up? I mean, your family can live with you, right? Code Section 119 says your spouse and children. I buy the rules of the premises. Remember, in this case, he's the owner with his older wife, right? Don't they set the rules? You're on to something, but I'm not sure if that's how you would articulate it. So anyone else? One more one more shot. Do you think it's because again, it helps, I think, when you're thinking about tax outcomes to think about the policy underlying it. All right. So but let's just think to ourselves, you guys I think, maybe I'm wrong, at economics, right? undergraduate or part of your program. You're probably familiar with the concepts of utils, right? And that when you spend money, uh, presumably you're getting an equal amount of utils or else you want to spend the money, right? Everyone agree as a general axiom that what you spend your money on, you get in return, agreed? So with respect to housing, if you're living in a nice house, you might derive, say, $100,000 100,000 utils, whatever, use whatever measuring rod you want, okay? In your opinion, uh, I'll turn to Natalie, 100,000 utils is if you live at a nice apartment that you chose. How many utils would you give if you had to live in a funeral home? <laughs> You're not paying for it, but how much utils would you derive? 
not driving. The day loudly. You're not driving any. You're not going to drive any? Does that mean you're really, really miserable? Remember, 100,000 utils is bliss, right? You're living in a great place, maybe looking over the sea, uh, the ocean. Um, funeral houses. Good ones, too. Okay, but let's put it this way. You don't want to live there, but it is free lodging, right? So, you know, depending on your economic status, it's not a bad thing. Everyone agree? So it's probably not heaven on earth, no pun intended. Um, so it's not where you're going to hear birds necessarily chirp in the morning or the, the waves of the ocean coming in. Um, but it is free lodging. Everyone agree? So what's my, my point? It's the perfect place where you live could give you 100,000 util, but living in a funeral home is going to give you something less. Agreed? And, and sadly, I, I would say it's not going to give you zero, right? Because otherwise you might have to spend renting, I'm making up numbers, three, four $4,000 a month. Now you don't have to spend that, okay? So I can't put the number of utils on it, but it's probably not worth zero but it's certainly not worth 100,000 utils, but it may be worth, say, 20,000 because you're afraid, right, that at midnight if you get hungry and you open the wrong refrigerator door, it may be a little ghoulish, right? <laughs> All right, so the point is because of those fears and maybe the, the smell of formaldehyde, um, I have to tell you a weird story since I'm on the topic of uh, mortality. Um, my younger daughter is applying to medical school, so they uh, took us on a tour, and they say, oh, we have the, which we call it room? Um, the cadaver room, okay? So they're all in plastic bags, but they've got literally the cadaver room. I don't want to exaggerate, 70 cadavers. So I think most funeral homes don't have that going on. But it's not the most pleasant environment, right, guys? So um, I share your misgivings about living in a funeral home. All right. So having said that, the congressional point of view is, hey, if someone's getting free lodging, right, in a funeral home, we don't know what it's worth, but we're not going to tax you, right? Everyone agree? And some of you may, for example, work at, say, McDonald's, and the first meal is a happy meal, right? But your thousandth happy meal may not be so happy, right? And if the boss needs you on premises and says, look, when you work here, you can't leave, and you've got to have a you know, Big Mac uh, every day or at your lunch, it may not be taxable, right? Code section 119. So all I'm, all I'm trying to address with you is what was the policy motivating Congress? Is that Congress was trying to uh, acknowledge that some of these work arrangements, and Irvine, this dovetails with your point, you may not get the necessary benefit that normal people would if they had bargained for it. All right, so bearing that in mind, page 103, the question, Employer provides employee and spouse and children a residence on employer's business premises having a rental value of $15,000 per year, a charging employee only $6,000. What results if nature of employee's work does not require employee to live on premises as a condition of employment? So in this case, Nellie, taxable or not in Sherbon, do you agree? Taxable, the, the 9000 What's your authority? It's one. Sure, fine. Agree or disagree? Agree. All right. Everyone agree that this would be taxable to the extent it's a tax-free benefit, not tax-free. Taxpayer here is getting on um, nine thousand dollars, right, of in-kind benefit that would be taxed. How about question B? What results if employer and employee simply agree to a clause in the employment contract requiring employee live in the residence. And how would that change the outcome? But it, it doesn't say it's required. It says that they simply agree to a clause. 
Does that suggest that it might not be necessary? This, this is suspect, right? Everyone agree? Can't just remember in the Walter case, that's the case where the person called what well, was compensation of bequest. Similarly, you can't just make something non taxable by just putting it in the agreement, right? Oh, we'll put a clause in the agreement that says you have to do this, but it's really not necessary. So if it's just put into the agreement, but it's truly not necessary, um, this would not work. Question C, what results if employees work and contract require employee to live on the premises, an employer furnishes employee and family $6,000 for the groceries during the year? On tax or not in young, see if you're great. I ask you guys a question. Anyone here major in English or any, any of the humanities? Would you guys ever, ever been talking to friends, family, or neighbors? Say you're going out for a meal, for, for Persian food, Raza. Would you ever say, um, you know, instead of going out, um, I'm going to have the groceries delivered? Does anyone treat the word groceries and meals as being synonymous? Do not. I don't think so. I have seen I have seen in the office. Um, they have the cleaning lady on um, when they were expecting meals, like expecting breakfast. They would. If Those are meals, but no would, one brings in food from Shoprite and say prepare your own. They brought the food and ha have her just chopping the food with the strawberries and serving them. Well, but still, I mean, the notion Congress wanted was, hey, if you need quick meals to stay on the premises, that's one thing. But the supply of groceries is wholly different in nature than meals, right? Congress, when Congress uses words, they, the people of Congress mean words that they put on paper, right? Does anyone treat meals and groceries as interchangeable? I don't think so. But this would not qualify under Code Section 119, guys. This would be taxable under Code Section 61. Question D, what results if employer transferred the residence to employee in fee simple? Do you guys know what fee simple means? Want to Google it? Guys, got it. Fee simple means outright ownership. Simple means outright ownership. In fee simple in the year, employee accepted the position and commenced work. Does the value of the residence constitute excluded lodging? What result if employer transfer the residence in fee Raza? Say it loudly. Why? Max, you have your second chance? Natalie, what do you say? Why? Transfer the residence. Certainly not a gift. Awards are taxable. John? I think uh, the purpose of this law is to enable employees to live in this place. But well, lodging, right? Yeah, lodging, but... Is, is it different if you're given outright ownership? That's not lodging anymore, right? Yeah. Just like groceries are not meals? If you get title to the apartment, right, there's no exclusion. It's not lodging. Lodging connotes a temporary use of a place, right? So this would be taxable, Code Section 61. Question two. Planner incorporated her motel business and the corporation purchased a piece of residential property adjacent to the motel. The corporation, by contract, quote unquote, required Planner to use the residence and also furnished her meal. Planner worked at the hotel and was on call 24 hours a day and she excluded value from income. So, in this case, in two, you, you did. Did. Taxable or not, and Jack, see if you agree. It's not taxable. 
Well, she's not there. She's not on premises, right? And doesn't code section 119 say you have to be on the business premises? So do you write a note to your client that taxable or not? Jack, what do you say? Looks like that's gonna be taxable. It might, but of course, Jack, you would do research, right, Jack? And you would look, in this case, life is pretty easy for you. Look on page one or two of your textbook. Under note, everyone see note on page 102? If you look under note, the third line down, if Commissioner B. Anderson, hotel manager was always on call, the residence owned by the hotel manager, two blocks away from the motel, the court concluded ownership was not test to, uh, <coughs> that the ownership was not to test the business premises, and the term means either at the place where the employee performs a significant portion of duty to the death. Code section 119 was held inapplicable because the on-call status did not constitute a significant portion of the employee's duty. Compare with Jack B. Lindemann, which held that a residence adjacent, you see the word adjacent, Jack? Adjacent to the motel, across the street, but not geographically separated from the motel, was on was therefore on the business premises. Um, but if she worked at the motel, isn't that now the business premises? That would be fine. When when she lived though adjacent. But if but if she lived two blocks away, also work where she lived. Work what? I'm sorry. And Worked if, at the module and was on the call 24 hours a day. Right, but if, if she worked down the block or across the city, would it qualify? No. Everyone agree? If our if our taxpayer walked worked across town, even if she was on call 24 hours a day, her lodging would not qualify under Code Section 119A. So if she walked worked across town, worked 10 blocks away, worked two blocks away would not qualify. If she lived on the premises, definitely would qualify, right? If she lived at the hotel itself. You guys see the movie The Shining? Okay. Code section 119. When I watch the movie, I'm thinking, okay, code section 119 applies, right? And if he lived adjacent, we have a case authority, not taxable, right? But Natalie, if the person lived a few blocks away, I'm troubled by the outcome. Yeah. So, okay, for example, um, just think about the university. The university is really large, and if you live like the edge of the, the, the campus yeah. and give the residential room, it doesn't matter how the dis dif distance from your work. That doesn't matter as long as you're on the business oh. premises. So, when you say business premises. But we know at a hotel like the Hilton, we know what the business premises are. Yeah, so. And some Hiltons are huge. Yeah. Some, like, have you guys been to the Atlantis? Anyone here? Max? Yeah. Is that a huge property? Huge. Yeah. We live at the very corner of the, the Atlantis, and some of us have been to much, much smaller hotels. Go ahead. So should it be like a, like something like same building permit or something? Like oh, that, That's not what the code says. It's on the business premises. And that's going to fluctuate. Some business premises are huge and some aren't. That's okay. The Internal Revenue Code is not going to micromanage that issue. All right? But Jack would be happy to know that there's case authority, right? That's directly on point in this case. And you would do research, right? We look at the, the code's not going to tell you, the regulations aren't going to tell you. You really got to do some research, and that's where good research comes in. So, uh, for um, authority, I would put case commissioner versus Anderson. Well, personally, no, Lindemann, the Lindemann case. Oh. Um, but what I would say to the Anderson case held against the taxpayer. Do you want to want to say to Lindemann? So. Jack, I would cite to code section 119 coupled with the Lindemann. I don't think you just want to cite to Lindemann, because it's in Lindemann is an exploration or an extension of 
Code Section 119. Okay. Uh, highway patrolman is required to be on duty from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eats lunch at noon at various privately owned restaurants which are adjacent to the state highway. At the end of each month, the state reimburses him for his luncheon expenses, or such luncheon expenses included in his gross income. So picture, if you will, state uh, patrolman, state trooper, um, Jersey, what are, what are the restaurants along the New Jersey Turnpike, guys? The Barrows, what, what, what's here? Starbucks? Barrows, Wendy's, Rogers. I'm just trying to think. Let's say Starbucks. So we have a, the officer stops at Starbucks every day. Um, I don't know. It's the uh, feta spinach uh, wrap, right? You guys are all familiar with it. All right. Get that. Get his uh, Java chip coffee. Uh, in, you know, in this day and age, that can cost you $15 at Starbucks. All right. So do the arithmetic five days a week, $65 uh, times 52. That's $3,000 worth of benefits, right, guys? Annually. Agreed? And the officer takes position. This is an actual U.S. Supreme Court case, not taxable code section uh, 119, right? So let's reverse this. Raza, taxable or not? They're not taxable. So you say the taxpayer prevailed at the Supreme Court level. Natalie, do you agree? Okay. Okay. Sure I, I agree too. The kids in the military. Where is the business premises here? Is it really the highway? Most of us know state troopers, right? And I don't know, but there's different stations along the turnpike, right? Where the station is, right? And you make the argument that the business premises, because he's a state trooper, extends to the whole highway plus the restaurants along the highway. Good, but are you going to be successful in the Supreme Court? Taxpayer loses here. Tell that Code Section 119 does not apply. This is taxable income under Code Section 61. Why? Because here, keep in mind, what is, it, what is the employee getting here? He gets cash. He doesn't get meals, right? And picture, if you will, if the station said, look, we really need you around in case there's an emergency call. We're going to supply you with meals, meaning we have someone on staff who's going to actually prepare the meals. And the purpose is for you to have a short meal, and if some emergency happens, you drop everything and run out to the emergency, right? You can see that's for the convenience of the employer. Everyone agree? But here, the person is down the highway, um, away from the business premises, not getting, the meals aren't being supplied by the employer, they're being supplied by a restaurant, right? And they're getting cash reimbursement. So this does not fit comfortably within the code, code section 61. Um, do they have any, any clause saying that the, in the premises there should be a kitchen or a microwave or something? It doesn't say that, but it says on the business premises. No, 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 but in order to, ta uh, to tax or not to tax meals. You say that. Definitely. You have it. I, we all have the same code, Jiang. So if the police station uh, buys the meal from the various private privately owned restaurants and provide the food to the policeman is okay, right? If it's at the station. Yeah, if it's okay, right? I think that might work. Okay. And that gets to question four. And question four, this doodle, a high-tech firm in the Silicon Valley, mm -hmm. files, files, hires Jacques and his um, staff from an exclusive restaurant to provide gourmet meals at its offices around the clock to its employees. Doodle police meals will be incentivized employees to work longer hours, shorten the time taken between meal breaks, track new employees, and help it remain competitive with, a, with other Silicon Valley high-tech firms. Are these meals excluded under Code Section 119? Well, many of you may have friends 
Any of you have friends who work at high tech firms and their meals are provided? Where does your friend work? He works at a Bloomberg in Liberty. And what happens? Does he get kind of gourmet meals, lunch, dinner, breakfast as well? Pretty much. Three meals a day, right? Two meals. And they're good, right? Yes. This is not mac, mac and cheese, right? No, not mac and cheese. Steak, fish, like rice. And he gets no, or she gets no 1099 reflective of income, right? Let's put it this way. You guys are going to be working, some of you at least, at a big firm or regional firms. that they supply you with breakfast, lunch, and dinner, taxable or not? Not tax for what? Because they have us around the clock. We have to be there at 7 and we live around 11, 12. So they give us a Starbucks, they give us some donuts, they give us whatever we are. They, that's different from, I'll call it de minimis. Those are de minimis. Do they give you three meals a day? Which firm do you work for? Why? And they have, like Max, his friend, a chef comes in and cooks all that? No, we put they had an allowance for 15 breakfast, 35 lunch, and 50 dinner. <laughs> I mean, if they do, many times they ask you to charge it to a client, right? It, that, that's different. Because that, the client picks up the, that burden. Okay? That's different than these places where there's no client picking up the burden. So, the authors raised this question in this edition of the book. It's not in the earlier edition. But, by the way, you know where this is happening? I'm looking up, um, Aang, Justin, up in the sky. But I'm not really looking up in the sky. I'm looking up at Audible. I've been up to Audible. There are corporate offices upstairs. Guess who's being served three square meals a day, right, right in this building, right? And... Is that equitable? Let's get back to tax policy. Does the average worker, um, at a rank and file, who works at a company, do they get max what your friend is getting? No. no. Everyone agree? Um, and these benefits, if you do the arithmetic, you're getting three meals a day or even two meals a day. You can do the arithmetic and saving your you know, that could be the equivalent of five, ten thousand dollars worth of income, right? Being received tax free. Query. Is that what Congress had in mind with Code Section one nineteen? I would argue not. Um, I would say it's taxable, but right now it's an open ended question. Most of these firms are taking the aggressive posture that it's not taxable. We're going to see in the weeks or months or years to come the IRS is going to, how the IRS is going to pursue this. Right? So I'm not trying to make your notes ambiguous, but there's no clear answer to question four. All right. We know we said to skip chapter five, and we know in general, right, that awards are not taxable. Everyone agree? Awards are not taxable. Is a new code section, one which is very, very important. Code section 1001. Do you want to open it up? <coughs> code section 1001A. Gain from the sale or other disposition of property shall be the excess of the amount realized therefrom over the adjusted basis providing code section 1011 for determining gain, and the loss shall be the excess of the adjusted basis in such section for determining loss over the amount realized. Okay? So, I hope Justin and um, think you, you can see this. So, Code Section 1001, I think I suggested to you last time, but if not, it bears repetition, that for gains to be taken into income, gains must be realized and recognized, two fingers, gains must be realized and recognized, and losses must be realized, recognized, and allowed. Realized, recognized, and allowed. Okay. Congress is going to be much more circumspect with respect to losses. 
not going to be readily permitted. So the first half of this chapter, chapter six, deals with basis computation. How to compute <coughs> tax basis, right? And that's going to be one half of our formula, just the basis. The second part of the chapter looks at the amount realized. Once we are numerically get the right answer, the gain or the loss, we're going to move on and look at chapters 21, 22, 23, and figure out what is the character of the income. Is it ordinary? Is it capital? Is it recapture? Because important tax consequences stem from the character of the income. Just to make this point, when you buy stock, let's just keep it really easy for a moment. If you buy Google stock for $100, what is your tax basis in Google stock, guys? $100. What's your authority? No, because that is section 1001 talks about computing gains and losses. It doesn't tell you what the tax basis is. So it's section 1012. What is uh, share bond? What is code section 1012 entitled? Uh, property. Cost basis, right? So if you buy Google stock <laughs> for $100, your cost basis is going to be $100. Again, my authority, your authority, code section 1012. Agreed? Getting on page 116, we have a case. This is Philadelphia Amusement Park, which is not the easiest case to read, okay? Truth be told, it is not the easiest case to read. So if you're having a little trouble with it, you're not alone. It's not an easy case to read. But let me just, anyone um, know where the Schuylkill River is? No one? Got to get you guys out more. Um, well, River is right outside of Philadelphia, okay? Um, anyone been to Philadelphia recently? I repeat. Ah, Max, you're getting out a bit, right? What brought you to Philadelphia? Uh, for a half marathon. Okay, what does a half marathon consist of? My edification. 13 points. Okay, I... I Genuine flunk and uh, admiration. So that's a nice, nice distance. All right. So, and do you recall passing the Schuylkill River? Or no recollection. No recollection. Probably too tired from doing all the running. What is one run? Well, do you mind if I not put down the spot, but put down the spot? What, what was your time? My time was out. Hours and okay. hours and forty minutes. Everyone, impressive, right? Right. Kudos to you. All right. Philadelphia Amusement Park. Here we have. Uh, unless someone wants to, anyone. I, I don't need to hear myself speak. Anyone? Anyone volunteer? Want to tell us what this case? Jack, go um, for it. So this amusement park for uh, yeah amusement. Um, they trade. They they have a bridge built to have cars pass. Whatever bridge cars pass. And right. They, they build a bridge. Yeah. And they uh, I guess change it with the government for uh, ten more years of franchise for the company. Right. They exchange. They exchange it with the city. I think it was with the city of Philadelphia that yeah. they're gonna give a, up a bridge and in return they're gonna get an additional. 10 year franchise um, for, for using the bridge. So I'm not quite sure, but in other words, they give up a bridge, which is not something ordinarily bought and sold in commerce, right? In return, they get something unusual too a 10 year franchise that after using the franchise for several years, they were going to abandon it, right, Jack? Yeah. I don't think they ever end up using the 10 year. They right. use a portion, but not the entirety. A little bit. Then what happens? Um, they have to determine whether, or like they have to determine the cost basis for the uh, remaining years of the franchise. 
And they want to know the, the, the basis in the remaining franchise because they want to take a loss. And remember, guys, the fact pattern here predates the 1954 code, right? So if you see a code reference to, for example, Code Section 113, it's not a misprint. It's because it's a reference to a pre-1954 code section, right? So Code Section 113 is the predecessor to Code Section 1012, right? They need to figure out the basis. And ordinarily, Jack, what is your basis, putting aside this case, what is the basis of the property that you typically acquire? What is the basis of the property? Generally, it is the property. Well, in other words, let me translate that. It's the fair market value of the property you receive, right? Everyone agree? Your basis in property is generally the fair market value of the property. So if I exchange property with Shia, and I know what my property is worth, $200, and I get property in return, even if I don't know what the value is of Shia's property, but we have an exchange of property, we're, as long as we know the value of one thing, if we're at arm's length, chances are the property that I receive in return is worth 200. Everyone agree? That if it, we may not know the value of the, both properties, but as long as we know one, we should be okay. Agreed? So the authors make the point in the opinion, the judge, that often it's not the fair market value of the property you give up, but it's the fair market value that you receive. And 99.999% of the time, the two are the same. Everyone agree? Because otherwise, she and I would not engage in a, an exchange if we didn't feel like we were getting fair value. Agreed? But here's something unusual, because in this case, the taxpayer is giving up a bridge, which very hard to know the fair market value of because not too many bridges at Walmart these days. And conversely, there's not too many 10-year franchises to use a bridge, right? So the court is stuck trying to figure out what the, the basis is. So what does it do here, Jack? Um, yeah, I mean, the court, they, they remain the question to the lower court. And this would not be my favorite case because the rarity of the fact pattern. I've been doing this for a long time, guys. I've never had an issue of someone not knowing the fair market value of at least one piece of the property. So it makes for an interesting case in a case book, but it's really not something that comes up regularly in practice. And there's no definitive answer. It's remanded to the lower court. So I'm not worried about a Philadelphia amusement. It doesn't come up, I think, ever in practice. So um, the authors are just trying to sensitize you to what is cost-based, okay? And then I'm just going to point out to one other thing in the note on page 119, that if I acquire property, say, for $100,000, and I have to pay legal fees of 5000 to acquire the property, I have to capitalize the cost of those legal expenses in the property. So my cost basis is not just 100000 It's 105. dollars What's my authority for having to capitalize the cost? Code Section 263 talks about capital expenditures. So if you have capital expenditures, um, those costs have to be capitalized. Let's look on page 120 of these problems, unless you guys have any questions. Owner purchases some land for $10,000 and later sells it for sixteen. dollars okay? Everyone with me on the fact pattern? Determine the amount of the owner's gain on the sale. So let's just take uh, Nolly and Shervon. Problem A. What do you say is the gain here? Uh, the basis is 10000 and the realized amount is 15000 so the gain is And what's your authority? I don't want 
and 1012 realized. I guess it, it's 16,000 amount realized, basis is 10, cost basis, gain is $6,000. And all, let, let's just call this retention. Okay. Code section 1001C. Code section 1001C says, except as otherwise provided in this subtitle. This subtitle is all of income tax. The entire amount of the gain or loss determined under this section on the sale or exchange of property shall be recognized. Okay? So all realized gains are recognized. Do I see that? Now, can I make an observation because you guys are beginning to get a sense of what is the internal revenue code? Is this truth as in the as in always true? Or will all realized gains always be recognized? Or are there going to be exceptions? There can be exceptions probably, right? It's the Internal Revenue Code. And many of you, just by way of example, anyone ever hear of a so-called 1031 exchange? Natalie, you're saying yes. Do you know what that means? Robert, can you give it to Right. Where do you think they get the uh, moniker 1031? You know. Natalie, check out code section 1031. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And by the way, anyone of you guys ever participate in a 401k plan? Where do you think the number comes from? 401k, the internal revenue code, right? See how life comes together in this class? All right? 1031 exchanges. Not tax, the non-recognition. So we're going to see there's several other non-recognition provisions. So I don't want anyone to leave here today thinking, oh, Zola said, the code says, code said, uh, all gains must be recognized. It does, but there are exceptions. 1031, under the most recent tax act, uh, like kind exchanges are non-taxable, but that's limited strictly now to real estate. Why? Because the real estate's pretty, pretty powerful in this country, right, guys? Question B. What difference in A above if owner purchased the land by paying $1,000 for an option to purchase the land for an additional $9,000 and subsequently exercise the option? Okay. You know, Wendy? So what do you say? Is the answer the same as A or different? Same as A. Wendy, agree or disagree? I disagree. I need the cost basis. But that's what we said in problem A. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Right, the answer here is the same, right? I do have the authority. What does it say anything about that? It, it, it doesn't, but we know and you know that the person has had an expenditure of um, $10,000, right, to acquire the property. $1,000 initially and then $9,000 more, right? So that became their cost base. Question C, what result the owner would be Rather than actually acquiring the land, owners sold the option to investor for fifteen hundred. So in this case, Han, John, John, tax point on Han. What do you say? Han, do you agree? Um, I'll say five hundred is the gain. Five hundred dollars. Why? What's the amount realized here? The amount realized. Uh, fifteen. Fifteen hundred. What's the basis? Um, One thousand. One thousand. On, you agree? Yes. On. Five hundred. Right. In other words, they bought this, right? Um, for a thousand, right? Initially, the option. They sold the option for fifteen hundred. Okay. Question D. Would it make any difference above if owner purchased the land by paying $2,000 cash 
uh, from owner's funds and an $8,000 payment by borrowing $8,000 from the bank on a recourse mortgage. He's personally liable. So, in this case, tax share. Does your answer come out? We're going back to problem A. Yeah, what would be the answer here? Yeah, what's the amount realized? Yeah, what's the amount realized? That's a trick question. Plaza? What's the amount realized? Well, isn't it back to problem A? But the amount realized, 16, right? The amount realized includes cash you receive, right? Cash for the fair market value. That's the amount realized. What's the basis? What did we decide it was? 10,000. Code section 1001B. The amount realized from the sale or other disposition of property shall be the sum of any money received, right? Plus the fair market value. So, Roz, as if the amount realized here is 16000 right? That's the cash. Question A. What results in A above if owner purchased the land for 10000 spent $2,000 clearing the field prior to the sale, and then sold it for 18000 So, in this case, um, A, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, and good. So tell me what's the amount realized and what's the adjusted basis. And Jordan, if you want to put on your mic, uh, you can you can say if Ing is right or wrong. So go for it. Uh, for year, right? The three. Uh, the realized is eighteen thousand, and uh, uh, the basis is twelve thousand. So the gain is uh, six thousand. All right, Jordan, agree or disagree? Jordan, you there? Justin, I'm saying Jordan. Sorry, Justin. Justin, can you hear me? I agree, I guess. Great to hear you verbally, but we'll take the, the, the Okay. Now, Jordan, can you type or say the reason why the basis is 12000 Do you have any authority for that? Justin, any authority? Any authority for that? 263. 263. Now, I want to add to that. Look together at code section 1016, everyone. Adjustments to basis, code section 1016. Proper adjustment in respect of property shall in all cases be made for expenditures, receipts, and losses, or other items properly char chargeable to the capital account. So essentially, Code Section 1016 talks about the fact that property should, with respect to improvements, I'm going to paraphrase that, should be increased by the amount of improvement. Okay? I see, Justin, you don't have a mic, so you do have to type out your answer. All right. But, Natalie, so you can say to Code Section 263, Code section 1016. So, you're right. The basis should be adjusted upward by $2,000. 2000 yeah, $2,000. Question F. What difference in E above if owner had previously rented the land to let the for five years for $1,000 a year per kit? Per year cash rental and permitted lessee to expend $2,000 clearing the property. Assume that although owner properly reported the cash rental payment, 
the $2,000 of expenditures were excluded. Okay? So in what results in E above? We're back to E. This is question F. Are the cash rental payments income, guys? The cash rental payments income. Not a trick question. You are, right? Now, what's your authority? Code section 61, right? Now, I always say, guys, to do tax and do it right. Um, picture, if you will, you're going to be in the sho shoes of the owner, okay? Everyone has a visual. You own this property. Zola's renting it from you, and I'm making improvements to the property, okay? So picture, if you will, you guys have a ranch, and I'm going to dig a trowel, okay, a ditch uh, to make it easier for myself to water the – like to supply water to the cows, okay? So you're renting the property to me for five years. I'm putting this improvement, uh, I, I either do it myself or someone else does, it puts in $2,000 for improvement, okay? Do Wendy have income as a result of me putting in this, this ditch? Okay, not according to 109. You feel wealthier, no? Do you think, do you think that you will benefit from my ditch, John? Yeah, because it reduced effort. Well, let's put it this way. You guys are all the owners, each one of you, right? And you each allowed me to put in the ditch. So you wouldn't, if you thought it was going to make your property worth less, right, you wouldn't have allowed me to put it in. Everyone agree? So it, must, it may not be worth 2000 to you, but it's certainly worth something to you because, again, after my lease is over, you're getting back the property, so you presumably think it's worth something. Agree? No. If you read this fact pattern and the property is sold, what is it sold for, guys, here? Question, what's, it, what's the property sold for? Say again, Nelly? 18, sold for 18000 is the amount realized. What's the basis here? But it's young? 1019. What does 1019 say? Um, so it shouldn't for so if it, if the lesser do it, it shouldn't be so or diminish. Ah. So notwithstanding code section 1016, code section 1019 says no basis adjustment, right? And this makes sense, right? Because um Wendy alluded to before. When Solar makes this improvement on your property, Wendy, you felt richer, right? Every one of you felt richer. Was it taxable? Was it taxable? The answer is, it's usually Code Section 61 says if you feel richer, it's taxable, right? But Wendy, what code section did you cite to? No, no. What authority did Wendy have? You're listening carefully to what I did. 109. 109 says what, Wendy? Ah, so now, guys, we have a peanut butter and jelly code section, right? So it's code section 109 and 1019 go together. Don't you agree? 109 says the improvement is not taxable. And code section 1019 says there's no basis adjustment, right? Does this make sense? The answer is yes. Why does it make sense? Because when I make this improvement to your property, it's not entirely clear how much your wealth went up. Sort of like Code Section 119, where Congress excludes that from income. Here, though, Congress can look at Wendy, say, Wendy, you don't have taxable income, but that property is apt to go up in value, and when you sell it, guess what? There's no basis adjustment. So, when you sell it for 18000 what's your basis? This is weird. There's something wrong with the screen. But that's 18000 over 10000 The gain here is 8000 So 
Congress isn't worried about taxing Wendy immediately, right? Because Congress can't put a dollar value. But when Wendy sells the property, we know with specificity exactly what her accretion to wealth will be. So do you see how Code Section 109 and 1019 work in tandem? All right. So, um, Justin, you got that? All right. Hank, you got that? You see these, these two code sections working together? I think you just typed yes. That's square. That must mean you really get it. All right. Um, I was waiting, Justin, for a third yes question. All right. Question G, you ready? What difference in results in AFUP if when the land had a value of 10,000, owner or real estate person received it from an employer as a bonus for putting together a major real estate development? Owner paid $3,000 to tax on the $10,000 fair market value receipt of the land. Ken, what is there a difference in results if the real estate person received it and as a result of receiving it under Code Section 61, they included it and they paid $3,000 of income tax on it. I think uh, you're talking about the basis, right? You said, what's the amount realized? Oh, yeah, 16. All right, 16,000, right? Okay, then what's the basis here? Why do you say 10? Because in uh, ten, Code Section 1016, one. A, uh, I taxes or other carrying charges uh, should not be. Yeah, in other words, taxes do not, Natalie would tell you this, taxes are not an adjustment, right, under Code Section 1016. So the answer here would be the same as in A. There's no basis adjustment for the income taxes paid when you receive the real estate. Question H. What difference if owner is a salesperson in an art gallery, owner purchases a $10,000 painting from the art gallery, but pays only $9,000 for it instead of $10 because of a qualified employee discount. An owner later sells the painting for $16. What's the amount realized? Let's take the easy part. Uh, $16,000. Yeah. $16,000, okay, 16, right? And the question here, right, Shervon? What's the basis, right? And what would, might you say the basis is? Might say the nine thousand, right? But if you said nine thousand, let's just play out the different answers. Say nine thousand, isn't this employee effectively going to be taxed on ultimately seven thousand? Going to be taxed out of that extra one thousand if they qualify as a qualified employee discount, right? Yeah, but we also said, go ahead, Gian. I think um, the basis should be the cost that you pay. So you pay 9000 right? Yeah, so um, in general rules, that the basis of property shall be the cost of such property. So the thing is, um, better authority than their basis. So what would you say the basis should be here for this problem? Nine. Does anyone say the basis should be 10? Why? Value of the property. But, Jiang? But your wealth um, increased the amount of 7000 because the, the, the amount you actually paid is 9000 And it's not, and that, that 1000 is not like something you earned from service or anything. Right, but then you're, you're in part supporting the policy objective of Code Section 132, right? Because now the person effectively is going to be taxed on their qualified employee discount, right? Yeah, it's, it's a qualified discount. It's a current benefit, not a uh, compensatory. All right, so, but here, check, everyone open their code to 132C4. Open your code to Code Section 132C4. You want to have one, Code Section 132C4 open. Let me read it to you. The term qualified property or service means any property. Notice this parenthetical. Natalie, you can see it? 132C4. Raza, you have it? I don't think you have it, Raza. 
You're, you're looking in the wrong part of the code. I can tell it from here. 132C4. Are you in the regulations, Raza? Okay. Find 132C4. Got it there, Raza? Okay, 132C4 says the term qualified property or service means any property. And notice this parenthetical. Other than real property and other than personal property of a kind held for investment. Let's pause for a moment. This painting, if you just hang it in your room or hang it in your house, is it for investment or for enjoyment? All right, everyone agree? You got the Mona Lisa, it's in your house your enjoyment. Agree? But if you start selling and you worked at the museum and they gave you, you know, a Picasso just because you're a great employee and you hang it in your house, you can get a qualified employee discount. Agree? Museum is bad. It's a tax exempt entity. But you get my gist. If you start selling the property, then presumably it's being held for investment. Agree? It changes its nature. Do you qualify for the qualified employee discount any longer? No, because it's not qualified property anymore, right? So therefore, the original discount you got is no longer applicable. So the better answer here would be $9,000 should be the basis, right? Because we're not worried about the person losing their discount. I'm lost. But the gain is $7,000. That's what you should have in your notes. Question two. In an arms, arms month exchange, exchange, Sharp exchanges some land for the cost basis of 6000 and a value of 9000 with Stahl. For some non-publicly traded stock which Stahl owns and which Stahl has a basis of 8000 and is worth $10,000 at the time of the exchange. Right? So, I have in my book, I wrote a little graphic here. You have sharp and dull, and that's supposed to be reflective of their brain power. So he has potential gain on dull of 2,000, right? And sharp has potential gain of 3,000. Everyone agree? Consider sharp and dull's exchange, gains on the exchange, and the respective cost basis in the assets they receive. So how much gain would Sharp have to exchange his property with Dolph? Choose the gain or loss to Sharp. Okay, let's assume it doesn't qualify for like kind exchange. How much gain would Sharp have here? We just asked Roger because she's chomping at the bit to tell us what is Sharp's amount realized here? I realize it's the fair market value of the property you receive, right? So search in 1001 b What's the fair market value? Jack, you're, you're not. $10,000. Ah, they not realize it's 10000 right? Isn't the property that Sharp gets worth $10,000? Was this just the basis? Six. Any gain or loss to Sharp? 4000 right? Right? What's the fair, what's the uh, basis? Now, is this sort of exchange really apt to happen, guys? Unless dumb or D is really dumb or dull, not likely to happen, right? We're going to presume the value in most instances is equal, but theoretically, this is the authors having fun with our Philadelphia amusement park page, right? You may not consider it fun, but um, they're just trying to illustrate this point. And question B, what results in A above if the value of dull stock cannot be determined with any reasonable certainty? Like, so dull stock cannot be determined, this cannot be determined with any reasonable certainty. Young? So the amount um, realized for Sharp should be eight because we don't know like fair market value. Mm -hmm. 
No, that's not true, though. Jack? Uh, shouldn't it be 9,000? Yeah, it should be nine. It should be, if you don't know the value of this property that you're receiving, it's the property you're giving up, right? Oh, that's, okay. Okay? So here, the amount realized would be nine because we don't know the value of Dull's property. So any gain or loss to add? What's the amount realized, Raza? What? Zero, did you say? Getting Dull's property. How much is the presumed value of Dull's property? Nine. Oh, I told you something. You might realize here is nine. What's the basis? Six. Gain or loss of how much? Gain or loss of three thousand. How about for doll? Gain or loss of doll? How much? What's the amount realized? Amount realized is nine. What's the basis? Eight. Gain or loss? One again. Ask, I mean, I like the questions from the first question. That I like question one with all this permutation. Question two is not my go-to kind of question because it doesn't come up in practice. All right. Any questions in general, guys? Uh, Jack, what was the authority for uh, Part B of the question two? Got to take the Philadelphia Amusement. Again, the case that does not come up too often in practice. Let me give you some hints for our reading for next class, okay? There's some more code sections we're going to add to your growing repertoire. If I make a gift of stock, okay, we know the receipt is not taxable. What's your authority? You receive stock. Don't get me nervous, guys. There's not that many code sections. You receive stock as a gift. Again, 102A, right? I give you guys a gift of stock. Suppose I bought the stock for $30. It's now worth $100, okay? I bought the stock for 30 It's now worth 100 What's your basis in the stock? Okay, 30 What's your authority? Our code section 132 deals with friends' benefits. I like the way you speak, Shervon. 10, what? We know 10, 12 deals with cost basis, so it's probably in the same area. It's not the same code section. And it can't be your cost basis because you guys ain't paying nothing for it. You got it as a gift. Yeah, would the authority be Tess versus uh, Bowers? That's just the Supreme Court. We need a code section. Oh. Uh, Natalie? 1015. 10, 1015. 10, 15. And what does it say, Natalie? Paraphrase it, please. If the property was acquired by gift, its basis should be payment if it was held by the donor. Transfer. Carryover, right? So you would get my basis in my property. Mm -hmm. Everyone get that? I give a gift to you, you get a carryover base. This is good stuff for exam questions, right? Because this is the kind of thing your clients will ask. By contrast, if I die or when I die and I bequeath you that same share, what's your basis in the property? Fair market value. What's your authority? 1014. So, big difference between gifts and bequests, what the recipient's tax basis will be, right? That we learned that 1031 exchanges are not taxable, right? There's no recognition event. What about exchanges between spouses, taxable or not? Now, what's your authority? Um, 60, I think. No. No. 
1041. Okay. Now, beginning on page 133, we're going to learn about the amount realized, which I know, Rod, is going to be near and dear to your heart, right? You want to see? You know, we look at adjusted basis, right? We're going to look at it some more. Amount realized less adjusted basis equals gain or loss. And what we're going to see <coughs> is that the, um, we looked at adjusted basis, but next time we're going to look in more detail at the amount realized. Today it was pretty straightforward. Cash or receipt. And we're going to be introduced beginning on page 136 with the famous, famous, famous Crane decision. Okay? Crane is one of the most well known cases in all of income tax. So brace yourself. Um, you're going to get, you should read with as much clarity as possible about Crane. Let me give away its secret because you guys are here physically. Justin Ng, you're you're here um, metaphysically, all right? So you get to share in Crane's secret today. Roger, so you're not going to believe this, or maybe you will. The amount realized includes not only the cash and fair market value of property you receive, but what else does it include? Drum roll. Anyone want to tell me? Just say it loudly. That's not what CRANE stands for. Anyone want to guess? It includes debt. Okay? Debt is going to be part of the amount realized. So when you sell property and you're computing the amount realized, it is going to include any debt. Okay? That the bank or the, the purchaser assumes. And that's going to be important for exam purposes and with respect to your clients. 